welcome back to the Case for Quality Collaborative Community Virtual Forum. We have uh, a, a group, a, a very distinguished group today that's going to be hosting our workshop. And so I'm going to pass it over to Pat Schaefer from FTI to get things kicked off. So uh, Pat, it's all yours. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, George, can we go to the next slide, please? Which uh, talks a little bit about our agenda. Um, you know, very briefly, uh, we'll do an introduction and then uh, Jackie will do a deep dive into uh, quality strategy at which point um, or after which uh, we'll have a panel discussion where I'll be moderating um, with uh, Liz, uh, George and, and Jackie on the, on the topics that we present or that Jackie presents. Um, and then from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time, we'll have a one hour lunch break. And right after that, uh, we hope you will join us as part of the uh, quality strategy workshop. And, and we'll go into uh, more of what that's going to be uh, in a bit. Uh, George, can you go to the next slide, please? So a little bit about our mission. Uh, one of the goals of this and, and all of the uh, case for quality work streams has been to really move the industry uh, as a whole from a culture of compliance to more a culture of quality, uh, where we're not looking just to check the boxes and achieve uh, the minimum viable uh, level of quality just to stay compliant, but really to, to look for continuous improvement. And, and continuous improvement can, can really drive so many things, or, or a culture of quality can drive so many things. Um, such as reducing the cost of poor quality, um, you know, basically integrating the customer voice so that we can design better products, uh, and, and generally uh, improving business performance and, and, and making our companies a, a more enjoyable and um, deliberate uh, place to, uh, to work uh, because we're all thinking about patient safety and, and the, the quality of our products. Um, one of the key elements to achieving a culture of quality is of course, uh, leadership engagement. It's, it's not enough to have policies and procedures in place and have an, uh, you know, a, a complete quality management system. But our hypothesis was from the get-go that senior leaders, whether it's the CEO or the, the site president or, or, or site leader, um, they play a very significant role in setting an environment or establishing an environment conducive to quality and conducive to that improvement and conducive to that um, patient focus. We require or uh, the, the leaders must basically champion the quality initiatives in a meaningful way. What we didn't know was, you know, where are we today and, and what do we need to achieve that? And so we, there, is, there was a um, it was called the CEO engagement uh, work stream. Then it was called the leadership engagement work stream because we recognized that the, the value or the, the role of, of promoting a culture of quality went beyond just the CEO, that it really had to be all leadership. Um, and, and a group of us, uh, most, and there were many people who participated, but, but uh, the people most closely involved were Joe, uh, Sapienti, myself, Sarah Sulfridge, Robin, Donardo, Meda, Prakash, Jackie, Rama, uh, George Zach, uh, Segalen, and uh, Ashley Johnson were all part of a team that basically uh, followed a, a certain path towards our, our ultimate uh, output, which was a playbook, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, you know, it involved really identifying. The, the, the best practices around culture from all of our organizations and, and also reaching out uh, beyond, including uh, surveys. We, we tried to capture an industry baseline. Where are we today? And then, as I mentioned, uh, collected those best practices and, and worked very diligently to, to develop a playbook, uh, at which is where we are today. Um, and then some of the companies or some companies have started piloting this playbook, not necessarily applying everything, but, but identifying those parts of the playbook that they want to uh, focus on. As far as what's in the playbook, uh, George, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, the first thing we did was develop this 
culture of quality baseline. And, and through interviews, as well as a, a survey, we tried to define where the industry is today and where are the opportunities for improvement. Um, one of our observations during this brief survey was that um, leadership might have an inflated view of their success. So uh, it was primarily leaders who answered the survey. Uh, we didn't do a companion survey uh, for the line workers who, who, uh, who could validate these, these results. So keep that in mind when you look at this. Leadership believes they do a really good job of promoting quality, 90% agreed or strongly agreed. But interestingly, they're very uh, transparent when it came to whether they prioritize quality over cost. Clearly, cost and financial performance drives a lot of the decision-making, uh, something that, that we wanted to explore in the playbook. Um, other areas of note were, uh, you know, do they really engage employees to better understand the behaviors that drive quality? Is it, is it a top-down communication or do they really uh, walk around, meet with employees and, and engage them in conversations that, that drive those behaviors? Um, where we seem to be failing tremendously is in terms of focusing on prevention over reaction, um, over 50% disagreed and felt that um, they are not doing a good job of, of being proactive. And then uh, only 39% said that they actually formally measure the cost of quality. So these questions and these results drove a lot of the thinking in terms of collecting the best practices and uh, building out the playbook. We could go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to just spend a moment describing what's in the playbook. We're going to be talking about uh, quality strategy uh, specifically in the, in the uh, minutes that follow and, and also in the, in the workshop. But just to give you a brief uh, synopsis of what's in the playbook, uh, first of all, why develop a culture of quality? Um, you know, I talked a few minutes earlier about some of the benefits of embracing a culture of quality. There's this uh, adage that uh, quality eats strategy for lunch, meaning that you might have the best strategy in the world, but if, if you don't have a culture of quality, um, I think I meant to say culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, you know, culture really drives whether people uh, walk the talk and, and do what they're supposed to do. So, so it's so critical to develop that culture. Um, and, and executives must demonstrate that culture of quality and, and it must be apparent in their actions and behaviors as well. Quality must be a priority. And so um, our hypothesis is that if you do prioritize quality, the, the financial results will follow. That if you have people understanding the role of quality in terms of value-based care, in terms of being able to set higher prices for products, in terms of reducing waste, um, by making quality a priority, you are actually addressing several other objectives, including business performance at the same time. Um, measurement is critical and, and what you measure is critical. If you're focused on measuring, uh, not that you shouldn't be measuring uh, the performance of the quality management system and looking at things like Kappa aging and that sort of thing, that's good, but you should also be using, looking at proactive measures, whether it's um, trying to measure culture or trying to uh, look further up the value chain and, and, you know, look at quality across the entire life cycle so that you can take corrective action before incurring uh, costs of poor quality. So we and you know just spoke about being proactive rather than reactive. Uh, the need to define quality at an individual level. Everyone should know what their role is in terms of uh, promoting a culture of quality and and achieving better quality and safer products. Uh, encouraging quality behaviors, uh, looking at tools such as uh, benchmarking in order to uh, 
identify best practices that you can implement in your company. And, and of course, um, using quality metrics. Finally, recognizing and rewarding quality, making sure that you reinforce um, quality through through the uh, the uh, performance management system or just uh, separate uh, recognition and reward activities in, in your company. So that's what's in the playbook. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie now to talk more about specifically quality strategy. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. So when I uh, first started to become engaged with the case for quality way back in 2011, um, it was before we started kind of the, some of the deep work around leadership engagement. As we became more involved in leadership engagement, we started talking about culture of quality and how do you do this and quality strategy really came out as one of the, the first things that we need to worry about. But as a, a head of quality um, for many, many years, it, I didn't understand it. I said, I, what is a quality strategy? I don't have a quality strategy. I really have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and so through this, this um, kind of body of work, really thinking about what is a quality strategy. And it really starts with just the basic definition of what's a strategy. Um, and, and simply that's just a plan of action or a general plan um, to achieve whatever it is your overall goals are. Um, and if we apply that to quality, it's around where do we wanna be in quality? Next slide. So, this is a, a fairly busy slide, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on it, and I'll talk you through it. But as I said, the quality strategy is really your first critical milestone in how you develop your culture of quality. Um, and I, I tried to break this down in a way, um, and, and the team talked about this, that would make sense to what we really do in real life, right? Right. So we don't go into our offices as a, as a quality person and say, what's my quality strategy going to be? Hmm, I think it's going to be, we're going to be fantastic. Um, there's a lot that goes into thinking about what your um, quality strategy will be. And it starts with really your business. Um, you don't have a quality strategy if you don't have a business strategy or a business mission. And so typically how this works is you have your business mission and your vision, um, and that directly informs your quality policy. Um, your quality policy is really a, a more of a static statement is really how we're talking about that, right? It's uh, a statement that's made that says, we are going to follow the regulatory requirements. We are going to be committed to delivering product that's amazing and meets our customers' needs. And that has um, the, the highest uh, level of quality control. And so this quality policy is oftentimes where we stop, right? We say, we've got a quality policy. Our business has um, told us that we're gonna have this. It's on the back of my badge. So obviously, if it's on my badge, I believe it and I'm going to live it. Um, but really taking that next step to utilizing your quality policy and driving that to create a quality mission. Now, the quality mission may be as simple as I we want to uh do the best that we can for our company in delivering and supporting a great product. Um, that quality mission, and, and you may skip that, you might not have a quality mission, um, but that quality mission or your quality policy even directly and your business strategy, what is it that I want to accomplish in my business? Those are really the key components to what that quality strategy is. Um, and that's not the detailed goals and objectives, right? That is really what is the overall um, the overall 
uh, mission or, or plan for what I want to accomplish in my company as it relates to quality. Now, I put over here the quality plan because sometimes we don't talk about quality strategy and goals and objectives. We say we're going to have a quality plan. And that's really the embodiment of a good strategy and your goals and objectives. We oftentimes call this a quality plan. The regulations um, lay that out for us. You need to have quality planning, right? But what goes into those quality plans are really your strategic thought and your goals and objectives. So we can go to the next slide. So we're just gonna um, take a, a quick look. Very, very typical um, business mission. This is actually located in the, um, the playbook. And our mission here is that we want to be a global leader. We want to have um, product that provides effective patient outcomes that enhances well being and ophthalmology. This is obviously a real live example. Um, the strategy to support that mission is that we're gonna focus on design, development, and distribution of safe and effective products. We're gonna grow the business and we're going to appropriately um, cost reduce uh, by eliminating waste. And we're going to be a place that everybody loves to work, right? These are a, This is a very typical business strategy that then rolls down into some business goals that says, we're going to have uh, high quality and safe products. So we're going to decrease our quality events by a specific amount this year. Um, and then we've, we're have we going to grow our business. We're going to increase our sales and we're going to make our employees happy. And we're going to go from 80 to 90%. So a very typical business mission strategy goals example, um, where there's a very small point uh, around quality and patient safety, right? And so what the quality strategy does is it takes that business strategy and it kind of explodes that into more detail around what you want to accomplish in your business as it relates to quality. And so let's go um, so let's go to a, a little bit more discussion around that. So quality strategy development, again, don't get, um, kind of don't get sidetracked by the words quality strategy, right? It's really the beginning of your quality planning. Um, it's what you want to accomplish and why you want to achieve quality or more quality or build in better quality. Um, and you, it, it's really, it's a very simple process. We're going to actually exercise the process today because although it looks simple on paper and we can talk about it a lot, one of the things that we have um, discussed and experienced in real life is that when you're trying to put together your quality strategy, it might not be as obvious as you think it is. And there's a lot of things that kind of go into that. Um, understanding what your quality vision is or your, or your mission. Like, where do we want to go overall in the future? Um, three to five years from now, what's our overall vision? Um, really looking at data and understanding um, both metrics, like key systems, complaints, and your inspection, management review outputs, but also um, deliberately gathering um, additional data, like regulatory changes that are going to be coming, or what's the current environment for risk? Um, what do our competitors look like and what are they experiencing in their product quality? Are there recalls that we should be thinking about? And all of those things, industry advancements, all of those things should really be data that you think about in understanding how to put your quality strategy together. Then we're going to define and articulate the strategy, which sounds pretty easy. But what I would say is in our uh, work this afternoon, I think what we'll find is sometimes it's not so easy to stay at the 10,000 foot level. We oftentimes, me included, want to head right to the actions. Here's what I'm, what I'm going to do in order to get to my vision. 
Um, and sometimes it takes uh, a little bit of patience and, um, and I guess some e experience and just practice in order to articulate a nice, succinct strategy. And then, of course, no strategy and set of objectives and goals is going to be appropriate unless you ensure that you're properly aligned with the business. And we are going to talk a lot about that today. And um, based on some real life experiences where quality strategies didn't quite work and some where they worked really well. So let's go to the next slide. This happens to be a real live example from um, uh, a, a quality strategy that I <clears throat> worked before. And our business mission was that we were passionately committed to a partnership with clients to improve and save lives through respectful, trusting, collaborative environment. That led to our strategy, which was that we wanted to deploy new processes, procedures, and tools to integrate services globally, which is um, was new for our company. We were a global company, but we were very, very segmented um, in different locations. And we wanted to do that in order to meet our clients' needs to accelerate their time to market. So a couple of things here that were key. We wanted to integrate to be global. We wanted to have some new processes and tools, and we needed to help our clients to go faster. So any kind of quality strategy that we were going to put into place, if it didn't support that business strategy, it was going to be a non-starter. So you can see here the goals for that business were to retain associates that really hit on our respectful, trusting environment. We wanted to improve our IT tools. Um, that was um, key in trying to integrate globally. We wanted to improve our service and we measured that by NPS. We wanted to improve a quality index. That was an amalgamation of several different quality metrics that we would put together as a one top level score that we would track monthly. So we wanted to improve that. We obviously wanted to improve our sales and um, improve our profit margin. And the improvement of profit margin really would come from being more efficient. So let's look at the quality strategy that went along with the business mission on the next slide. So our strategic plan, um, and to be honest, we skipped a mission, right? Didn't feel like it was a necessary piece of what we needed to do. So we went right to kind of what was our quality strategy here. And our strategic plan was really around implementing quality processes that would support global business by the use of efficient and compliant processes. We wanted to create a hybrid quality management system comprised of key global quality processes and procedures while still allowing site and business flexibility to meet compliance and business goals. That was really important because we had clients all over the world and they needed to go fast. And so in some cases, we needed to be very nimble in certain processes. So the goals and metrics in order to monitor our progress against our strategic plan, which obviously this strategic plan was going to carry us over more than one year, but our yearly goal um, that, we, that we put out there was that we wanted to provide advanced training to all of our quality associates um, in order to get them to um, understand all kinds of, of, of things. I think in that year, we decided that our advanced training would be around um, the different global regulations and how those informed our quality um, processes. We identified a global EQMS system um, that we wanted to implement that was going to be critical. We created a global metric for customer service that was different than NPS. So we went one step further to ensure that we were really meeting our clients' needs. And then um, we improved our investigation process. We wanted to decrease the timeline and expense that would hit our profit margin, but it would also help us to go faster in meeting the needs of our client. So um, when I took that strategic plan back to my business, 
Um, it's not surprising that it was, you know, very well received. It met each of our different business goals very crisply and cleanly. There um, was immediate kind of light bulbs that went, oh yeah, we do need a global EQMS. If I would have gone back, um, if we weren't intending to globalize, and, and I'll let you in on a small secret, um, the year before, that wasn't our business strategy. Our business strategy was still stay local, be nimble. Um, but we heard enough from our clients that were global that we really needed to move to a more global approach. I had come into the organization the year before, accustomed to working in global organizations, and I had proposed having a global EQMS the year before. Didn't go anywhere. Nobody cared. It was like, why do we need a global EQMS? It has nothing to do with our business strategy. So, and, and that, you know, in hindsight, that's kind of a duh, right? It's like, well, of course it wasn't approved or it kind of fell flat. But in the moment, I had been hired as the first global quality head. Um, my intention when they had the intention when they hired me was to help globalize and harmonize. And so for me, step one is global EQMS. I needed to let the business and the um, business leadership catch up to that thought process, right? They weren't there. Um, after a year of kind of pain and suffering and feedback from clients, um, they were finally there. And, and our business strategy really caught up with the CEO's vision. And that allowed me to then implement the quality strategy that I had wanted to implement from the beginning. And it went somewhere. Um, so that was for me a lesson in, uh, in understanding the connection between my quality strategy and what I think is best for our quality system versus where my business is. And um, maybe I do know best, but if they're not there, it's not going to go anywhere anyway. So need to find other ways um, to, to uh, maybe teach before we, before we strategize. So um, if we can go to the next slide. So that takes me to uh, a conversation about kind of quality strategy out of the box, right? Can there just be, here's my quality strategy? And, and I think the lesson that I had at that company um, was a little bit about me personally, and, and there is some ego involved, right? If I'm very honest, about me personally having kind of an out of the box solution. Look, I did this before. I was a global head of quality somewhere else for like over five years and was very successful at implementing a global EQMS and harmonizing. And that's why you hired me because I've done this before. Um, and so that kind of one size fits all mentality um, was where I started. Of course, this is what we do because this is what I did. Um, and what I found out was it didn't really fit where we were um, in our business mission or strategy at the time. The other things that are going to um, kind of inform your quality strategy are things like risk tolerance. Every business has a different tolerance for risk based on where they're at in their, um, in their journey of their business. If they're a well-established business, they may be more conservative, a younger, more entrepreneurial business may be taking more risks. Um, it can depend on how large they are, how small they are, where they're at in their development cycle. All of these things help inform the risk tolerance. The CEO and, and where he's been before, or your COO, if they've gone through a warning letter before, they may be a little bit more risk averse. So all of those things kind of fold into what your quality strategy would be. You may be willing to take a lot of risk. Uh, you, may, you may not be willing to take much risk at all. Um, what are your gaps and issues? Why am I going to implement a, um, a uh, complaint process that's global if 
I've got complaint processes in all my local areas that are rolling up just fine from a metrics perspective and they're being worked aggressively and everything looks okay, right? Why upset the apple cart if that's not something that needs to be done? Maybe that's a, a future state, um, but maybe that's not the things that I, the thing that I want to um, focus on right now today. And I think typically we're pretty good about understanding our gaps and issues and how it relates to our quality strategy. Um, but the other thing that, that we really need to think about is what is your culture of quality? What is your standard of quality? Um, if your company is very far along their culture of quality journey, and these things are kind of rote, everybody has a quality in their in their uh, job description with a little Q, um, then your quality strategy isn't gonna be all about education. It's not gonna be necessarily all about getting people to understand things better. Um, if your culture of quality is, is in the beginning of its journey, maybe you're not gonna start with updating your procedures. You're gonna start with some basic education, some maybe some quality uh, quality days where you bring in your customers and you talk about the product. So there's all kinds of things that really don't allow us to have kind of that quality strategy out of a box. And so um, be wary of someone who says, oh yeah, been there, done that, can do it again, no problem. There, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, right? Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, before we get into where I think the real learning is going to happen through our, um, where we talk through some of um, these real live issues in our panel, and then we go off and break up into small groups, um, let's just talk about some key takeaways, right? So for me, um, I've got the scars to prove it your quality strategy really does need to connect to the business and it needs to make sense to the business. Um, you're not going anywhere as a quality professional without the rest of the business behind you. Um, and sometimes that's not so awesome because you know where you need to go and you've got a lot of teaching to do to the rest of your executives in order to get them to where you where they know where you need to go to. And that can be painful, um, but it's absolutely necessary. Quality strategies can take many forms. Really, most often I see them implemented as quality plans, the quality planning cycle. I rarely hear quality strategic, right? It doesn't, it's it's I think starting to happen more that way. When you go out and Google quality strategy, um, be interested to, to find that one of the things that comes up is CMS. They actually have a quality strategy and quality goals and objectives to, to uh, meet their quality strategy. I thought that was very interesting. It absolutely requires stakeholder input and data. You have to know where you're at in order to know where you're going. And that's kind of an obvious, right? It needs to change over time and it will change with the needs of the business. So at least on an annual basis, reviewing and updating your quality strategy slash quality plan is something that's, at, that's really necessary because, again, your business strategy and your business planning will change. And the final um, takeaway here would be that um, the quality strategy, quality planning is really that key input to building a culture of quality. Again, you might be starting in the very beginning with let's teach people what that's all about, or it may be further along where it's let's refine it. Let's ensure that we're really doing, uh, maybe we need to refresh the learning. Maybe we need to refresh what we're doing here. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Pat um, to go into our next session. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, so for our panel, we have uh, three people who have been very much engaged in the, the playbook and in um, our work since. Um, Elizabeth Gepa, who, who is uh, Vice President of Quality Management at BD. 
George Zach, who is a principal at Two Harbors Consulting, and of course, Jackie, whom we just heard, principal of QRX Partners. And so, um, Jackie, you gave a good example of uh, quality strategy gone wrong, or at least delayed. So let me start with uh, Liz and perhaps uh, put the question to you. Have you ever experienced a quality strategy gone wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, could, I can share two uh, examples from some of uh, my past experiences. Uh, and, it, and the first was uh, an example where, you know, the quality organization and strategy was really focused on driving compliance to regulation uh, very specifically. However, the company strategy was about improving product quality, reducing complaints, improving customer satisfaction and customer experience, and hence a little out of sync there um, with the focus. Um, the second one is uh, an example of growth, right? So your, your strategy has to evolve as your company changes. And so if a company is growing uh, through acquisition, I've, I've had experiences where um, you can't rely on the same strategy that worked for a much smaller company. It's, it's out of sync in, in terms of how people need to work and, and execute on, on the quality strategy. So those are, those are two examples that uh, I've lived through in, in my, my past. Thanks, Jack, uh, Liz. And George, before you answer the same question about a strategy gone wrong, um, Jackie just uh, put in the chat, Yes, we would love to have your questions as well. So uh, I'll be monitoring the chat um, during the, the rest of this session um, and, and we'll work those questions into the dialogue. Uh, George, quality gone wrong, your thoughts? Sure, um, you know, I think when, I, when we were first working on this from a chapter perspective, I fell into the mental trap that this was something that was easily done by many organizations, uh, especially big organizations. And like, look, the, the big organizations have, have already got this figured out. And this quality strategy thing is more, more of a small company problem. Uh, as I've continued to do work post the chapter and I've thought about this, um, it, it, it's really a core issue, I think, for a lot of organizations is landing on a quality strategy that is clearly articulated and understood and congruent uh, with the business strategy. So as an example, and, and I'm going to you know, kind of speak with some degree of anonymity to protect organizations, but this might be something that some of the, uh, the participants can relate to, is you may often see in an organization, uh, if they're a manufacturing facility, um, they have a year-over-year -year, um, business goal that comes from a strategy to reduce costs. So, look, we are looking to reduce costs 5%, 10% uh, every year, or maybe it's even 1%. Uh, and then there is, on the quality plan side, uh, there's some sort of objective or goal of uh, no reportable events, reduce the complaint rate, um, limit the number of recalls. So when you start to back this up, you might start to see that when you get to a strategy that's somewhere in the middle between the business strategy and the quality strategy, that's where you start to see where there's things that might not necessarily line up and there hasn't really been thought to a quality strategy. So uh, you know, an organization that's producing something, a legacy product that maybe they've been manufacturing for 20 years, they're really stuck as to where can they get an additional 5% out of their uh, for cost reduction out of their product and their manufacturing. And so they start thinking about things like, hey, maybe we can we can uh, change the design so we, we can reduce this complaint rate. But if your R&D department is also over there, like, hey, we have to keep our costs reduced as well. And, and we don't necessarily want to go into a new design consideration and all the submission associated with that from a regulatory perspective, you can start to see how the organization and their functional silos start to come at odds. And I think one of the key points that, that, um, that Jackie's presentation tries to bring across is a strategy is really as agnostic of the functional departments, right? It is a strategy for the business, for the organization. And so it's it, my initial thought of this is just a small company problem. No, it's often maybe even more of a problem in my experience with some of the large companies because strategy not being something that you have an 820 dot for, it's something that's not thought about until after the fact when they start to kind of come at odds at each other, at each other within, within these different functional departments. George, thank you. 
Um, Jackie, you, you mentioned in your example a situation where the organization just wasn't ready for a global quality strategy, um, and they eventually came around. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit, uh, again, in the context of a quality strategy gone wrong, more in terms of uh, the strategy changing, the business strategy changing, and uh, the concern about the quality strategy perhaps being out of touch with maybe a new strategic imperative, whether it's a, a whole new line of uh, products or, or whatever the case might be. Do you have any examples that you can uh, relate to us? Yeah, actually, um, I have uh, one example where, and I think that this is probably pretty um, pretty common, right? In, in our industry, we're doing a lot of... Uh, acquiring and merging and things like that. So oftentimes you can um, you can have competing business priorities, right? So where I learned the, the global quality stuff, right? Where I was really cutting my teeth, my, my entire intention was to harmonize and globalize all of our nine locations. And we were very successful. I had a fantastic team. It was a great company. They did they did a great job of kind of harmonizing and globalizing in about two years, uh, you know, a great EQMS system. And we were just trucking along. And the whole intention was that as we were growing and acquiring that we would harmonize and globalize, right? This is why we did it. So um, we acquired a company and I happened to be the acquisition program manager of all things. I don't know why they put a QA girl in charge of that, but they did. It was fun. Um, and for me, the quality strategy around how to um, bring that company in was pretty clear, right? Well, of course, we're just going to harmonize and globalize. That's what we do. That's kind of what we're built on. That's where we were. Um, and so as I went to the first acquisition, uh, some of the acquisition meetings and everyone's giving their strategies. My uh, global head of quality systems came in and said, here's what we're going to do and here's how it's going to work. And um, even though I was the acquisition lead, it, it didn't kind of filter through that the whole intention of this acquisition, which is odd, I'm kind of looking back thinking, how did I not know this? Um, they they really the 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 president of the of the company that we acquired was a hundred percent committed to staying completely separate. Now went through and had those conversations with the CEO and said, I'm not so sure this is a great idea. And look what we did and why we did it, because we had so many rogue sites, right? So do we want to actually bring one in as a rogue site to begin with? And the answer was yes, yes, we do, because that's what the, the president of that company wants. He wants to stay. He wants to be the guy. Um, and so the, it, it, it absolutely, that's what ended up happening. So, uh, I mean, hindsight, probably should have picked up on that. Um, but I will say now it's like six years later and it's, they've been fully harmonized and globalized. So who is to say who was right in the beginning, Pat? All I know is that all I know is that it definitely wasn't the time, and the strategy needed to change. And so we really needed to focus. Um, the new strategy had to be: how do we ensure that their individual quality management system rolls up in a metrics way, so that the executive team had visibility? Um, maybe not specific touch points but had visibility to what was going on. So that was a very different strategy than harmonize and globalize. Understood, thank you. Liz, um, I imagine that you found that over time quality strategies change. And, and I wonder if you could comment on how often and, and what are some of those drivers for change that you've experienced? Yeah, so so great point. And, and somewhat related to what Jackie was talking about, I, I think you have to keep the pulse on 
what is changing in the business? Uh, you know, what new acquisitions are coming in? What's changing in the industry? What's changing in the culture of the company? And, and you have to have frequent checkpoints. I don't think you can be prescriptive, though. I don't think you can say, hey, every year we're going to change our quality strategy. Because what you don't want to do is, is have it be the flavor of the month, right? So, so you do need to, to maintain consistency um, of your strategy over time, but it also has to adjust. And so, you know, you know, perhaps not the exact answer you're hoping for, like, you know, follow this formula, but it, it's really about having frequent check-ins with the right stakeholders, uh, having some metrics to see if you're still on track. And then, you know, again, socializing maybe through surveys throughout uh, your organization that, yeah, no, this is still the right strategy. Uh, and then reacting appropriately when you get um, data that is telling you, hey, we're off course. Oh, I, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think that there is both. So if I can plug the playbook beyond the strategy, then there's also chapters that talk about the how do you measure quality and how are you tracking to um, what you've outlined in your strategy. So there's additional guidance out there in the playbook that everybody can go download to get. But I think you're right, Liz, that there is this, uh, I'll use an analogy, right? A geology analogy. We have, we have things that are carving the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River is kind of carving down. Are we still tracking to that? And then occasionally a meteorite hits, right? We acquire a business that changes things. Yeah. Or, or one of our competitors does something that significantly changes the landscape of the market. Or you know, we have some sort of event that shifts it for us as well. So you have to have that flexibility to keep your eye on the long term, but be ready to be tactical to deal with shifts to your strategy very nimbly in the near term if such an event happens. Thanks, George. Uh, before I go on to a next question, um, I want to remind everyone that I am monitoring chat. So if you do have other questions, uh, please, please put them in. Um, do we, you know, the question to all of you and, and take your turns answering this, start, start with Jackie, is do we really need a, a strategy? I mean, can't we just have targets or, or goals or something like that? Of course, you have to ask me. Um, obviously, the answer is, of course, you need a strategy. That's why we're having a workshop on it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think um, it's really to me, what the strategy does is it provides the right framework and communication um, to the organization to set up, to set the quality goals up for success, right? So can you just have a couple of things that you're gonna do? Yes, but it's probably not setting you up for long-term um, continued success and kind of, you know, when I look at the quality strategy, it's really my story. It's the story that I want to tell around quality in my organization and how that story attaches to my business and attaches to my, my goals. And I think in an organization that is maturing, the lack of a quality strategy um, is, is uh, I think in more immature companies, you may not have a quality strategy. I think as you mature, it's, a, it's an absolute must because again, it's your story. It's the story that you want to tell to your customers, to your regulators, to your employees, to your executives. It's how you um, build that um, quality thought process in everything that you do. Without a quality strategy, you're really kind of missing, to me, it's it's kind of the missing link to pulling it all together. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Jackie. And I want to build on the framework part because I think that's key, right? It, it sets the framework so everyone knows how they need to line up, what they should be working on. Um, without that framework, I think uh, you can devolve into competing priorities, pet projects um, that might not be aligned with where the overall business is headed. And so I, it's, it's definitely necessary 
and and even more necessary, probably the larger an organization becomes, in my opinion, to, to have that guiding framework to keep everything lined up because, you know, smaller organizations have um, more opportunities for what I call higher touch. Um, and, and so maybe it, it's easier without a strategy at that point, but at a certain tipping point, an organization that grows really needs that, that framework to guide uh, actions. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about this when writing this chapter, is, is a strategy required? And, and certainly, you know, if, if anybody looks at 820 or the related regulations or 1345, the short answer is no, it's, it's not required. But, uh, and, and we also had conversations as to, well, does it have to be called a strategy? And, and I think you've even heard Jackie mention, look, you can call it whatever you'd like, or in a small company, maybe it's it's understood because there's some sort of just placard on the wall where everybody's like that, you know, maybe you call it a mission or a vision or whatever it is. But but really, I think underneath that, regardless of what you call it, your, whatever your kumbaya statements are with that, you have a why, right? And that's not even just applicable for medical device companies or teams or organizations. It's applicable, I would say, everywhere in business and industry. What is your why? And that way, when you get to challenging decisions between business and quality and employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction and acquisition, you have this thing that everybody has normed around and can understand and articulate in a mature organization, as Jackie says, that gives you some understanding as to this is how we decide. Or if it doesn't line up, maybe we need to shift our strategy now that we have new information. So again, very critical in medical device organizations, because I think we end up with this this, these kind of odds between business and quality in terms of a strategy perspective, maybe we see it a little bit more there, but I think it's applicable to have a strategy, have a why in all types of teams, organizations, and businesses. The next question, thank you, George. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is a free for all. So anyone just jump in and, and answer it. But the, the next question is around when should you have a quality strategy? And the, what makes me ask this is we've done a lot of work with pre-revenue companies that are mainly concerned about having a viable product. They're, they're still testing to make sure that the technology works. Um, they're not sure how they're going to commercialize it and, and scale up, but, but they're really focused on just making sure that they have a, a, a successful or viable idea. And, and the last thing on their mind is building a robust quality management system, let alone developing a, a quality strategy. Um, do, does any of you have a thought on terms of when companies should start to really focus on quality strategy? Well, that's a strategy that you've actually, from my perspective, <laughs> that <just> described. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, maybe it's a maybe it's a strategy that people don't want to necessarily like the, the strategy of we're a small business, we're just trying to get funding, and and we we're we're all familiar with those businesses, and we've dealt with the reality of those businesses, like yeah. to say, hey, I mean, because you know the obvious answer that we're always going to tell those organizations is like start focusing on quality now, start thinking yeah. about your your quality management system, not even from a compliance perspective, but putting in place the quality management system, put it in now because. It'll save you money. It'll make you more effective longer. But we've all been in the reality of like, look, I'm just trying to keep the lights on sort of thing. Yeah. And you know, maybe just coming out and saying you need a quality strategy just you know, closes the eyes and ears to people. They don't want to hear that. But what you just described, Pat, frankly, is the description of a quality strategy from leadership in, in, in that organization, right? They're, they're saying, we look, we can't focus on this right now, but we are going to focus on or we're going to just focus on these little these little elements, whatever those specific ones are. We're going to make sure we have the, the best suppliers in the interim. We're not going to worry about deploying a global EQMS just yet, right? Or we're going to focus on making sure that we at least have a pretty good DHF or whatever. What, I mean, and those are tactical things that lend back to a strategy. Right. But even if you if you don't articulate a strategy, you're 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 still coming up with a strategy in yeah. regards to quality. Yeah. Totally agree. And I think that, um, you know, we're, I was just interfacing with a client who, by the way, completely surprised me. They are in uh, research and development and they reached out and said, we would like to start talking about how to implement a QMS and what, what needs to be done when and how that works for us. Um, that was I mean, that's pretty mature, first of all. You don't typically get people who do that. 
I found out that the reason is because they both been involved in large companies who who had very, very stable quality management systems. So they, they're going into it eyes wide open, right? Like, hey, we know we need to do some stuff. Um, but exactly what you said, you know, their quality strategy is we're going to do as minimum as we can right now, but set ourselves up for future success. So we want to make sure that we have good supplier controls because we don't want to have to go back and, and worry about that later. And we're going to worry about, you know, complaint handling in two years. So just helping them articulate a quality plan and strategy around how are you going to grow in the next two years and what does that look like so that they can have a thought process around how they're going to spend money and what that looks like and and uh, how they make themselves feel better about coming from big companies and not having their full QMS. This actually gives them comfort in saying, okay, we're doing this like specifically for a reason, not just because we don't agree that we should have one. Liz, any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great example. You know, really early in my career, I worked at a startup and, and yes, the, the focus there is do we even have a product, right? But, but you always have to assume you will someday have a product. And if you start laying the foundation, even a simple way as, as George has highlighted and Jackie has highlighted, right? You, you have to give it some thought because if you don't give it thought, you're, you're going to get a lot of surprises much later in the process of things that you should have put in place, but you didn't. You know, like how do you handle complaints? How do you manage suppliers, right? And then it kind of blows up um, and might prevent you from hitting key milestones later in the process. So, I think starting early is always best. Keep it simple, though, and, and scale it accordingly as, as your business grows. Thank you all for those insights. Uh, we've reached the end of this session, and um, I wanted to thank George, Jackie, and Liz for um, their, their valuable insights. And uh, we're going to be taking a break now for one hour and then coming back, and we will be um, do, uh, working on the workshop. Yeah, just before we, we go to a, um, a break, I just want to remind everyone, I think we need you to stay logged in. Um, you can certainly stay off camera, you know, go enjoy your lunch, but but we're going to need to kind of plan the, the um, uh, breakout sessions next. So please stay logged in so we can get an accurate count. Uh, and then we'll be kicking off the afternoon session with kind of an overview of what we'll accomplish in the workshop, and then we'll go to breakout sessions from there. Great, thanks everyone. We'll see you in uh, approximately an hour. So we'll be taking you into breakout groups and you will be working to uh, actually develop a quality strategy based on the case studies that were emailed to you. Um, one of the case studies is on an acquired company or um, more of the startup version. And the other is the parent company that acquired that company. Okay. So they're similar with similar facts, but the perspective is different. We're not sure of the total group numbers yet. So don't focus on that uh, as we're, we're currently looking at numbers and, and moving folks around to balance. We're probably going to end up with four groups instead of six uh, for, for this round. Uh, when you look at your cases, and, and hopefully everyone's got their case and had an opportunity to read it, uh, we've provided you with the business mission and vision that's already defined uh, and some additional company information. Just like with any case, though, um, some of the facts are relevant, some of them aren't, and you may need to make some assumptions. So keep that in mind. We're going to be working in our breakout sessions uh, from there. And at the end, we'll be reviewing and discussing overall process. Oh, I see someone's in the chat. Steve uh, didn't receive the case study. Can someone send, uh, Leo, perhaps, can someone send the case studies out? And if you also didn't receive a case study, if you could uh, uh, indicate in the chat. Thanks for indicating that. Um, next slide, George. Oh, well, <laughs> we've got a bunch of people who did not get the case studies. Did the email not go out on the case studies? 
Yeah, the emails went out, but we'll fix it on this end. Okay, sounds good. So sit tight, everyone. Case studies are coming to your email inbox. And since it looks like so many didn't receive the case, uh, we'll spend just a little bit of time at the beginning of your breakout, just refresh you on the facts. So sorry about that. Not sure what happened. So in the, in the, the breakouts, we're going to be taking you through a structured view of designing the, the quality strategy. So first, in this case, we're going to actually go to review the mission that we provided. We'll take a look at the data. We'll talk about what's relevant, what's not, and what facts and, and key decisions we might need to make. We'll then roll that into defining our strategy, all right? What's the problem we're trying to solve and why? And then as time remains, uh, we'll, we'll catch up with some key um, actions to achieve the strategy, maybe at a high level. And then again, uh, to wrap that up, um, you know, what's our plan to monitor? Um, do we need metrics, review, et cetera? All right, so that's the process we'll follow. And as everyone can see, case studies are coming to you in the chat. So please uh, take a look at the chat and download uh, the case studies. George, next slide. Here's the overall schedule from one to two. Uh, so we've got a little under 60 minutes now. Uh, we will be working on the case studies in a group. Okay, so you'll be magically transported to your group, all right? And uh, some of you will have case study one, some will have case study two. We'll then take a quick 15 minute break uh, and the coordinators will regroup and, and kind of plan the next round. What we envision then though, is we would then come back at 2.15 and bring the group that had case study one and the group that had case study two back um, into separate breakouts. And, and from there, we will uh, come up with um, the best strategy of the two groups. And then we'll roll into the final review session. And then lastly, we'll wrap up the workshop, um, uh, talk about insights, questions, et cetera. All right, so that's the plan. I'm gonna pause and see if there's questions before we roll into the breakouts. All right, if you wanna, this is, yes. This is Joe real quick on this end, they're yep. just finalizing the, the group alignments now. So give us okay. some, a minute. Still need some more time? Okay, sounds we good. They're going out right now. Okay, great. All right, have a good breakout. Okay, uh, so let's see. I think we're about a minute in. Yeah. And yeah. Liz, do you want to cue this up or? I can, I can okay. cue it up. I was actually queuing it up to a muted mic, but uh, okay. let me try again. <laughs> uh, so thank you everyone. We are at kind of the final round and we're ready to share the two final strategies from the case study number one and case study number two. Um, so why don't we start with uh, case study number one and Robin is gonna share her screen and we'll, we'll share that with everyone. And then George will, will pivot to your uh, case study at that point. Okay, great. So you can see it up on the screen. Uh, Robin, do you, want, do you wanna read it or do you want me to read it? Fine, reading it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we had a lot of discussion in our groups between both groups, which was great. And we came in and um, very similar, but we had a lot to add to it. But our overall strategy would be to develop quality processes, infrastructure and people to achieve product approval for the FDA and prepare for broader commercialization globally while leveraging big co expertise systems resources and developing a long term quality integration strategy. So we really came at this about a little bit short term and long term. Short term, we wanted to really focus on getting that FDA approval, but long term, we needed to make sure we had a plan of what we're going to do for integration, as well as what we're going to do globally from a product since they wanted to go to see market. And so those were kind of the key things that we thought about putting into the strategy. And, and it was interesting because the, the strategy between the two groups was very similar, but I think um, as we merged together, the uh, Robin's team had, um, you know, included the focus on infrastructure and people um, in addition to, you know, framing out the, the, the quality um, processes as well. And so we decided to, to merge them 
Um, and then the, in the next round, we, we went and merged the actions between the two, the two groups. And so now you can see the consolid consolidated list of actions uh, between our two groups. So um, Robin, you want to hit those two or do you want me to hit those? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, so first we talked about, you know, really doing the baseline assessment of TMC needs, uh, the QMS needs, creating uh, between quality management planning, making sure we have a matrix of those actions, and then developing a product of quality plan specifically for the product to ensure we had compliant product and then ensure we have this tier one supplier assessment because there was a lot in the case about the suppliers. Um, we felt we need to conduct resource planning and capability assessment. Some things to consider there are the resources from TMC are only there for six months. We need to assess that as part of that. Identifying uh, TMC appropriate CMO and then developing the management oversight between TMC and BigCo. Then we wanted to assess the QMS system itself and define the integration plan and approach, um, whether that's independent or harmonized, and that could be short-term and long-term. Short-term, maybe it's independent. Long-term, maybe it's harmonized. And then define and identify the interim processes that are needed to support the PMA inspection. So again, thinking of that short-term goal. Um, we want to review the mission of TMC and BigCo and ensure we have alignment there between our company's missions. Um, we also want to have a baseline assessment of Big Co and TMC uh, with gaps around PMAs. Do, does either company really know how to submit a PMA and get approval? And then uh, we thought it was important to have achieve the product approval of 12 months because that's, you know, the focus of TMC. And then we had discussion on developing yield and cost targets as part of the um, goals because can we even make the product at the end of the day that we're trying to get approved? You want to add anything there, Liz? Yeah. So again, good merging between the two groups of the actions. And, and I think uh, between the both groups, we, we pretty much had covered all the bases here. But uh, I would love to hear what um, the thoughts are of the other group and, and what questions they might have based on our strategy. George, Jackie, team, question? Oh, just yeah. to be clear, so your you're coming at this, it's, it's the same companies, but you're coming at this from what perspective? From Tiny Co's perspective, right? Okay. The, uh, it's Big, big Co's helping Tiny Co develop the strategy. Yeah. Okay. So what, I guess my question would be, um, what did you see differently because you were tiny co or, or that it's, this is the strategy specifically for tiny co, right? Correct. So mm -hmm. how did you think about that differently than if you were going, if you were big co? Well, I think technically in the case study, we were a big co quality manager assigned with developing tiny co's strategy. Right. So you, you actually have the big co experience and you need to use that to help TinyCo. Right. So we had a lot of discussion of, okay, we have to help this small company get to their goal, but how much do we want to integrate with BigCo? And again, that's why we left the strategy about leveraging the BigCo expertise versus having specifics at this point until we do the gap assessments to understand where we even are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Did, did that answer your questions, Jackie? I, I think so. I okay. think so. I think, um, you know, what's interesting is we, and I think, you know, when I share what our two groups came up with, we didn't necessarily come up with something super far off, but I think some of the assumptions and the conversation behind it were decidedly different. Right. Yeah. Um, because we were big co <laughs> designing our own quality strategy. Yeah, hoping not to, you know, to but, incorporate but, Tiny Co as part of that overall strategy, right? Yeah, or no? Okay, <clears throat> George is going to love talking about it. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, like, we'll we'll give Tiny Co their strategy when when we are ready, right? 
No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, oh. I'm making that as a joke, but I mean, like, yeah, we've seen. I'm sure we've you've all seen, seen that. We've oh, seen yeah. those sorts of oh, things. Yeah. I mean, that's that, that's the point of the joke. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Right? Yeah, I'll give no. you. I'll give you my opinion when I'm ready for it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Your opinion when I'm ready for it too. Right. <laughs> Any, any other feedback on the strategy before we take a look at uh, case study two strategy? Questions, feedback? I think just um, uh, it's really, in- I think you're going to see um, when we get to it that it's really interesting to me, uh, even though Jackie warned us all as like a working group behind this, how everybody wants to go right to the objectives. Right. Uh-huh. And I, and, and, and she's like, you got to kind of keep pulling this back to get to the strategy piece of it. And that sounds so fundamentally easy. Um, and I think what I've concluded is like, you can't do it without, you have to kind of do both. You, it's kind of this back and forth thing. It's a chicken and egg mm-hmm. thing where you're like, mm-hmm. all right, look, we want to bring the product to market, but why do we want, why do we want to do that? And um, we have to be considerate specifically of their post-market quality system capabilities. Well, why do, why do we want to do that? What's, and there's this back and forth. There's not a really a right and wrong. There's this conversation Mm -hmm. from a strategy perspective to make those business slash quality decisions. I think that your group maybe had, we we didn't develop them perhaps as in a detailed fashion as you did. I think it's great. um, But it's, there's this kind of this back and forth there that is really interesting to me and seeing how these things are developed as a part of this exercise. Yeah, definitely. And as um, Big Co, you decided for Tiny Medical that you were going to leverage Big Co's expertise. We didn't say what, right? We talked yeah. about just where we could, right? We yeah. wanted to leverage that, yeah. but we had to do kind of the gap assistance to understand yeah. where. And we had a lot of discussion of, okay, do you want to keep it alone for the nine months to get approval and then leverage, right? So it's not necessarily even short term you're going to leverage right but you got to think they, they have more expertise yeah and well, then Julie, Robin, based on the case standing. based yeah. on the case study there appeared to be lots of gaps lots of work <laughs> teeny co needed and um let's not reinvent a wheel if big co has a solution that's working so i think that's what we want that, that's really college. interesting to me though because i mean that 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 mentality is often not what i see from the acquired company right like like, yeah, it's, it, it's more yeah. that you have the deep pocketbook. You know? Yeah, I think we, we, yeah. yeah, we had a good discussion in, in the first group about um, uh, th- there were some aspects that we did need to preserve, right? Particularly around the design and the knowledge, since it was a hand assembly that we had already submitted on, right? And but we probably were lacking in areas like a quality management system. Um, uh, you know, registration and, and so yeah. forth. So how do we like kind of pick and choose exactly. what's needed, um, yep. but but not lose, you know, the innovation part or the things related to the product uh, that that's really key uh, to, to getting to market. And because there were only nine months uh, and, you know, the good point was raised that we'd already submitted since we were waiting for an inspection we really couldn't change the manufacturing process, even if we wanted to at that point. Okay, cool. Anything else from the team on the, on the, the, the big co? Tiny co. Well, I'm asking if the big co folks have any questions oh, for, the, for the tiny, tiny co. co folks. For the tiny co. <laughs> I think tiny oh, co look. is right to hear from big co now, George. Yeah, I'm looking forward. <laughs> well, Um, (laughs) since we delegate everything in in big co, right. I'm going to delegate this to Jackie to present her screen. And then, um, (laughs) all right. We're going to have Sherry, Sherry speak to it. Well, Sherry and team. Very good. We value, we, we do. uh, One of our values is we, we do better work together. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, I, I, so I've been I've been just really fascinated listening to this, and so I just want to put in my thought really quickly before I dive into what the team had come up with. That I think based on the based on the bullet points that we were given, it's a very logical and appropriate 
assumption that Tiny Co. doesn't have much in the way of a quality system already existing. I mean, they're working from draft procedures and they have like five people. And um, But I would just caution again, just for my own very acknowledged personal experience, what I'm living in right now, that you shouldn't necessarily in the real world make any assumptions about anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of those assumptions that would be dangerous would be that an acquired startup um, doesn't have um, a, a robust quality system, uh, you know, on its own that would merit um, careful consideration before, you know, go away, you're going to do it our way, kind of big company acquiring oversight. And I, again, I say that with a very personal bias because for the past couple of years, I've been working diligently with my tiny little team and my little tiny co uh, <laughs> to establish what I think of as, as a robust yeah. quality system. So my little personal plug there. Um, Good insight. Thanks for sharing, Sherry. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, in general, it's it's true for anything that you know, assumptions, what do they say, right? <laughs> about yeah, anything. yeah, they're dangerous. <laughs> so, but I think given the data, um, you know, clearly that's not an assumption. It's a conclusion that we drew, um, you know, based on this, the data and this exercise, and it's quite appropriate. So um, one other thing, I, I thought that there was a lot of alignment. Um, I saw a, more detail. Um, in what was just presented, then I think um, our two teams had, or maybe the, the the one team that I was working with, we were a lot more focused on just working through strategy at kind of a 40,000 foot level. I really liked all of the detail that I saw um, in the, the other presentation. So I thought that was really helpful and I'm hoping to um, grab it um, uh, at the end of this session um, on the, on the um, upload available to us because I think I'm going to be able to <laughs> take some some thoughts away in the real world again but anyway so um what am I looking at um there we are okay so am I supposed to be kind of just I'll, I'll share the our our the strategy that that our team had come up with Jackie yeah. is that the idea? yeah yeah okay. and this is this is the amalgamation kind of of our two groups uh, decide I mean it's it's in Sherry's group's format but informed a lot by George group, George's yeah. group's um, thought process. And, and I just cut and pasted and kept theirs at the bottom there because I thought that was a lot of good detail, but yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'll kick it off and then I'll, I'll turn it over to the, the other members of the team. So I think the, the strategy that's here at the top is what we've come up with um, to establish and implement an effective and efficient QMS that ensures timely FDA approval and scalable manufacturing capability of the product, product AF, and enables future integration and continuous improvement of the QMS. So again, I feel like that is really aligned with what um, had just been shared regarding the short-term focus of getting that product out the door, um, along with the um, uh, the broader you know, goals of the QMS um, and the, and I think we didn't go into the details of what a QMS is, right? The people, the processes, the infrastructure. Um, I think that was good to spell out, um, but that I think we had just assumed was built into the definition of, of QMS. So, mm -hmm. but it's never a bad idea to be explicit. So yeah. Um, and so the objectives and goals that we had come up with, um, and I think maybe that on the bottom, maybe that's like a number six, the manufacturing scaling. So I think I'll, I'll treat it as such. So one is, again, just like the previous group had mentioned, the first out of the gate would be that assessment, the gap assessment, um, identifying gaps and risks um, based on where tiny companies QMS is. Um, and then determining then from that the risk, risk mitigation and action plan and leveraging as appropriate the expertise from the big company, um, for example, in post-market compliance, final work instructions, supply chain, et cetera. Um, looking at quality staffing needs um, kind of in the short term and then longer down the road, longer term to, um, again, support the immediate approval and then the longer term um, integration activities. Establish that framework for the integration decision um, decision making to align with again those longer term business needs, and then um, determine and implement integration and improvement objectives. Um, and we left that to be determined. 
Um, yeah. And then the whole question, um, that sixth aspect there, it's huge. It's not, not last but not least, it's, it's definitely huge of, of scaling everything, right. Manufacturing, um, um, and all of that expertise, the framework as well. Jackie, I have a similar question for you that you had for us on just the, the perception of how you came at this. Because like when I think of Big Co, not even reading the, the case of Big Co, right? Is this Big Co's strategy specifically for Tiny Co or Big Co's overall strategy? No, this is Big Co's overall strategy um, now that we have Tiny Co. And so really what you're seeing is Big Co's quality strategy for the foreseeable future is how to figure out how to work with Tiny Co and get the product to the market. I think one of the things that really informed some of this strategy was around and why it looks so Tiny Co centric yeah. is because um, that's where Big Co is going to grow. That's the business strategy. And so we really wanted okay. to make sure that um, when we took this back to the business team, they understood that quality understood that this is our number one priority right now is to get this product out the door and to, to make it successful. Integration is expensive and there's all kinds of financial um, targets around the success of integration. So it's going to be the elephant in the room if we don't specifically address it um, as the big co head of quality, right? The other piece was around um, how, how we need to communicate that we want to embrace tiny co and we don't want to overtake them because there are some factors in the case that were concerning, like people can leave after six months, right? right? And so-, so you- Can I ask a question? Cause I, I was struggling with the same thing. I think Robin's question was at, this is so tiny co-centric for a big co-strategy. It feels yep. like it leaves all the other $1.2 billion of business they had before acquiring tiny co kind of in the dust. So. Does the strategy need to acknowledge, um, continue supporting the businesses we have? Why will we develop? So I'll I'll answer that because I think and one of the things that I struck me immediately about Tiny Co's perspective is that in just in listening to everybody talk, there were there was a fence that was put up. We're Tiny Co. We're going to exist. We 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 need to, and and that. And whether or not you intended it that way, that was exactly kind of the there 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 was a uh, you know a pride in Tiny Co. Sitting on the Big Co side, I can tell you instantly that a lot of that opening conversation was like, okay, so yeah, so we're taking Tiny Co. And there was a, a and one of the things I kept coming back was look at these values, like your values, the values, the very top values on the, on the thing is like. Um, we value, we do great things working together and our employees are our greatest assets. You're, you say that, then you give a six month contract to these people. Right. I mean, that, that to me is like, something's fundamentally conflicting there. But then let's, let's, let's take all that back. So yes, you've got an established business that's a 1.2 billion global wall back. You also have this other new business that may have more intensity uh, may may challenge your own systems harder than they've been challenged before, and so, and there was the que- there was a, a statement that this may be the first acquisition, so maybe some of the language needs to not just be tiny co centric, right. but leave open the idea that this may be the first in a chain. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, think, go ahead. I, I think your point is well taken. We talked about. But, but I that. think. I think- Oh, George went off for just a second. Yeah, they lost him. Um, he'll be back. I think your point is well taken. We had multiple conversations around should we specifically talk about the product or not? We went back and yeah. forth in our group. Um, but ultimately, we... I guess we decided that 
Ultimately, I think we decided that acknowledging that the next year's of stra- the next year's focus of strategy was definitely going to be related to that product. Period. Regardless of, um, you know, and and, but I, I think that's a good point. Could we have added something to the strategy about keep everything else going in the background? Yeah, we could have. Not in an hour, we couldn't. <laughs> I thought it was interesting what Daniel was saying just about how Some us and Tiny Co. put up. Oh, trying to. This is difficulty here with, with um, the internet, I guess. But um, I, some of this is just, Julie, to your question, the. I I think you're, we're all right. Like you cannot be, you can't define a strategy agnostic of your existing products. Right. Right. You have to consider the strategy broadly. And it might be that you're saying, Hey, with the acquisition of this company, we're going to, you know, discontinue. I mean, you've all dealt with this, right. With, with your manufacturing plans, right. Hey, we're going to move this capability to this particular plant. We're going to deprecate this in this other plant. It's that's all part of the strategy conversation for the purpose of this exercise. Um, I probably, at least in my group, I pushed a bit of an ignorance to that since we were geared specifically towards defining an integration plan for, for tiny men. We totally did. But too. Yeah. That's, that's just one, that's just one chapter of the, I think that's just the way the case study is written, but you, you can't really do it a strategy for, for just one product. So your, your point's spot on. You have to be considerate of everything that's in your portfolio. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of the nuance in the case study like we had in ours. We were developing a strategy for Tiny Co, but we as our task, we were a big co employee defining a Tiny Co strategy. So it was also it's that nuance in in the ask. Like, you know, it just puts Great a point. little bit of a different perspective on what you're trying to to achieve and so. Yeah, and I found it was interesting what Daniel was saying about his perception of how it came across that we're tiny co and we're not because that's not what we discussed we said we're tiny co we probably have to but we want to do what's best for getting the product to the market not whether it was tiny co or big co so it's interesting just even when you talk about the other question of communicating your strategy right and how you communicate it and how it comes across Okay. Uh, anything why so for- angry, Tiny Cole? Why so angry? <laughs> we're not. We're not angry. <laughs> we're a very happy group. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> and anything else for case study two from from anyone? Questions? Other insights? Now that we've seen both, it, it's interesting to compare and contrast the the approaches. It's interesting to see how similar they really are at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing I took away is um, it a hundred, this cannot be done in your head of quality's office, right? You don't just go in as a head of quality and sit at your desk and then incubate a little about what my quality strategy is. Yeah, That's not going to work. Um, it really is an effort of um, conversation and sharing and perspective, and it shouldn't all just be quality people either, right? The quality strategy isn't owned. It, it might be um, driven by the head of QA, but it has to be owned by the entire company. It has to move along with everything else. And so um, I think that's important as well. I think the guiding questions that you, that Liz, that you put into the, at least the big co um, case study, uh, I'm less familiar with the tiny co in preparation for this, but the, the consideration of the internal and the external stakeholders, right? So this, the definition of strategy really 
and, and you know, you're seeing it in, in both of our strategies, assess, evaluate, you know, you're trying to figure out what the capabilities are. You're trying to be considerate of the people. Of course, there's this, there is this involvement of all of those stakeholders. And so to your point, Jackie, you don't just sit there and do this by yourself in, in, in 40 minutes, right? There's this, there is this, there's this archeology span that needs to be done on both sides uh, to truly be considered of what the capabilities are and how quickly you're willing to deal with organizational change. A hundred thousand yeah. percent support and agree. I, I feel like if I had an, an emoji that I could have put up there, like a hundred and a smiley face, I would, I would <laughs> totally agree. And, and, and from my experience, yeah, there you go. <laughs> from my experience, even if you've got like everybody at the at the kind of ma- you know management level grassroots everybody's sleeves rolled up ready to roll we all support it makes sense to us if you've got the executives in either or both uh, or any of the stakeholder organizations who are behind the scenes going like yeah sure whatever but you know stay stay focused on our own interests and make sure to protect our company's interests at all costs, and I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Who oh boy, it all kind of whoo, falls apart, right? <laughs> so I, I think, and this is again a, another trite saying that we all know is quality professionals of you know top management support is key. Um, cannot be under underscore understated how important that is that you have to have top management. Um, you know, d- directly communicated and also behind the scenes. Um, full support for any of these initiatives or activities, um, or it's going to be again really hard for the folks who are you know doing their darndest um, on the ground to uh, implement this. Yeah, that's a great point, Sherry. Thank you, because that'll be key to the success of the strategy, right? And then you know ensuring that you've got all those stakeholders uh, part of the process right from the beginning. Um, also, so it's a really good insight. Can you tell I've been around the block a couple times? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and it's all for the good. It's all good. I've, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot. So. <laughs> absolutely. Um, any other insights directly on the case? And then uh, if not, we'll just shift to kind of more of the wrap up about the process, insights you've had along the way. Um would you do anything differently now that we've gone through this experience? So I'm just going to leave those questions out there for the group and uh, please, uh, please chime in. This is the interactive portion of the wrap up. You know, one comment I would make is that, um, you know, the, the case study was set up with the acquisition already being made. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge the due diligence assessments that have to occur before acquisition. And if your company has a robust due diligence process so that when you acquire smaller companies, um, you're not acquiring, you know, um, warning letters and 483s and everything else that might, you know, be in the closet. (laughs) Good good point about due diligence, right? Yeah, excellent point. Thank thank you, Julie. Uh, I'd say my experience on that is there might be warning letters or 483s or whatever, and your business people don't necessarily care. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yep. You just need to know that they're there so that you understand how you're going to try and help mitigate it. Right. Exactly. Jillian, I think you've got your hand up. Yes. I, I think it's more of a question. When the exercise was set up and we were kind of looking at this from two different lenses, was the expectation is that we would have two different uh, statements and then we ended up with the same kind of similar statement, like with the two different lenses? I'm just kind of curious if there was like a rubric for what we were expecting out of this, because I find it interesting that it was so similar. I, I don't think we we had, there, there is no right answer, first of all, right? It, it was more about the experience and the process of working through it. And we didn't have a set, hey, we need to direct them to get to, you know, X, right, on the map, right? It, it was really more about the process of doing it. And then, you know, the insights that you would all learn along the way so that hopefully you can take back some of this when you are faced with trying to develop your own quality strategy, but no, Jillian, and, and 
Jackie or George or Robin or others who are on the working team, what are your thoughts? I, I don't remember. We didn't really have an end. Hey, it's got to look like this uh, when we were planning this. Well, I, just to back up a little bit. So, you know, the, the, the genesis of this was the creation of the playbook. Um, the playbook was written just over a, a year ago. And I think, you know, we, we completed it and uh, the, the folks that you saw on the initial slides this morning, their names, there was a bunch of people that contributed to it. Uh, yes, it's really hard to write a book when you have 10 different authors all operating remotely and, and like giving everybody different chapters. Uh, and then somebody has to kind of pull that all back together. The next thought that came from that was, let's go ahead and see if we can get organizations to pilot these concepts in, in the playbook. Um, not surprisingly, at least not surprisingly to me, nobody really signed up to be like, I am going to pilot chapter three, right? Um, and, and I think that's because, um, I mean, that, that kind of made, there's a, probably a variety of reasons for that, but it's, it's a bit challenging for organizations to say, hey, we want to come and pilot the quality strategy chapter because we're not, we, we're not doing that really well. That kind of puts you in a position of vulnerability. So then the thought here was, what are the things that we can do to different to illustrate the concepts in the playbook? Um, this workshop is, is one of those. And we, Jackie, Liz, Robin, a couple of others here as well. We took this on. We said, Hey, let's try this out where there's this, there's this use case of an organization needing to put together a quality strategy. And then from that, um, Jackie had those slides and, and Liz had the, the use cases and we modified those things. But, um, I don't think it was like, and we're expecting them all to come to the same answer. Um, and as so much as Liz had said, it was, can we really illustrate the, the concepts that are in the playbook and considering of, of a quality strategy? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it, it'd be interesting to see, you know, so there's a little bit of a bias here, right? Most of you, I think, are quality professionals or regulatory professionals. So we're probably all likely to kind of steer to the same sorts of answers. If we ran this experiment with this, like with engineers or business leaders or people in marketing and said, come up with a quality strategy, I mean, would they, if, would they come up with the same answers from tiny co to big co? I, I don't know. I mean, we're not going to test it out 14 times to do that, but I, I'm not particularly surprised that people of the same sort of ilk came up with a similar sort of consideration. Um, I would think we might get very different answers with different groups. Great question, Jillian. Yeah. And Jillian, great question, George. Uh, great response. And I think the other thing too is that what you what you heard, um, I think, was the comment about how to. And I think Jackie, you mentioned this about how the business side basically says, you know, let the quality and regulatory folks will figure that out. We're gonna we're gonna market the product. We're gonna commercialize the product. The warning letters, the challenges, you know, that'll all get figured out. And I think that's where the the difference between. Uh, what we would hear from marketing and sales or another function within the organization around, well, I'm, I'm looking for quality to help me with this, or I'm looking for quality to tell me what we're going to do, um, that kind of thing. So it's great that this group uh, was able to get to uh, the conclusions that you did. But I also think to George's point about the the implementation of the playbook, that's exactly the why the, the playbook was, was developed was so that professionals can share ideas and can share best practices and successful practices. And, you know, a very early on, we talked about, are we, are we on a best practice journey or are we on a successful practice journey? Because who decides what's best? And so this is the opportunity to really talk about what does, what could success look like? And if you all walk away from today's session with a couple of things that, Hey, I remember talking about that at the workshop and, you know what? Don't quite understand that, but I'm going to give Liz a call and ask her because I remember her talking about that, and maybe she can help me guide guide us through an actual real real world event, right? Because a lot of the value in what we do is being able to demonstrate those successful practices or give examples where it's been applied and, it, and it's worked, so that others can learn. So I, I think that's going into the planning. I think that's what the planning uh, part of this was. And you guys, um, if you were to ask me, and I'm going to tell you anyway, you guys nailed it. So uh, great job. So I got a slightly different point to mention here. I think m and is, uh, it's not a big company, small company strategy, but the divestiture is going to be a different aspect. There, they will have a big company strategy and a small company strategy. But for an m and it would be aligned, I think, a lot more. 
Yeah, I, I have to chuckle a little bit at how we all came to the conclusion about, about like, well, we need to better understand the due diligence, right? Because, I mean, we all have this expectation of due diligence or M&A type stuff where it's going to give us a lot of operational information. And, and you know, the, typically the financial people are just wanting to look at the books, right? And, and we don't get the opportunity to drill into the, that operational understanding. Yeah, I think it goes that, back to the principle of assessment and understanding what, what you're getting into with an organization. Yeah, I think if we were to do a, a due diligence uh, exercise or workshop, the first question I would ask is how many of you had participated in due diligences that resulted in a no-go decision based on a quality regulatory issue versus, exactly. versus taking on these challenges and figuring them out, which then plays right into your quality plan and your quality strategy. Exactly. So uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and I mean, to the being part of the, the M&A team at, at a company and leading some of that effort, it was sometimes even a question whether we needed to dig very far at all in quality and regulatory other than do a cursory review. Have they had a consent decree or a warning letter? Is there an act of recall? No? Okay, good. Let's just go. Because yeah. no matter what else you find, we're going to figure out how to, we're going to fix it. So don't we worry about that. And let's not waste resources doing that. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. Um, as a quality leader, that was horrifying for me. Like, <laughs> you're just going to hand me this pile of whatever. Um, but I did understand the perspective of my business leaders um, in the way that they approached it that way. I think my experience, what I was coming from, you know, working for Medtronic that does a lot of acquisitions is that we do accept that risk, but then our lessons learned are always don't accept that much risk the next time. <laughs> um, so we're constantly refining that acquisition process to be better. You know, the question is, do we actually uh, listen to our lessons learned? <laughs> Great insights. Other thoughts on the process itself? Was this easy? It definitely wasn't easy with the information given, right? That was yeah. just, a, that was definitely a lot of assumptions you had to made, make. Mm -hmm. And depending on those assumptions could really change what your strategy looked like at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Other thoughts here? Oh, Hillary, go for it. I thought it was interesting, just our different approaches and different starting points. <laughs> and, you know, how we, I mean, we all have one thing that kind of sticks in our mind from our experience or like our ghost from our past. And it, <laughs> we, we focus, you know, it's human nature to focus on that, that issue. So I, I found it interesting to listen to the different starting points. I, I, I would suggest that while this is driven as a quality strategy and, and we're looking at it at the business organizational level, that there are principles in here that are applicable. And, and maybe this is just so basic, it's, it's understood, but it's applicable not just for the big, the big organization, but it might be, org it might be applicable for a division or a team um, or a sub team, right? And it doesn't even have to be in devices. You, you're thinking, for me, the, the epiphany that I've gotten out of this and, and looking at the materials that, that Liz and Jackie generated and tying it back to the playbook is you're, you're, you're asking the why, right? Um, as a consultant, I often say like, it really comes down, you know, like, this is the secret of consulting, right? It's really just three questions. Right. It's, it's who are you, what do you want to be, and what are you doing to get there, right? And then there's a fourth question, why? Why is that important to you? And that can be applicable for your, your quality team or your regulatory team or your development team or your, 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 your facility, your manufacturing plant or your software group or whatever it is, or, or a, whole, a whole division. Obviously, it changes, you know, the, the nature of the game changes a bit when you look at that um, at those different levels of scale. But um, so 
my suggestion to this is that you can probably take the things that are in the playbook there from a quality strategy and some of these tools that you have in those case studies, and you can leverage those in other settings as well, as opposed to, oh, I'm only going to think about this quality strategy thing when I'm acquiring some company in Sunnyvale. We should have put in our strategy that we're all going to move there too, but that from Big Co, but headquarters going there, but I, I digress. Oh, everyone's remote now. No one moves anymore. This right? is true, right? <laughs> George, I think that's a good comment. Um, Medtronic's going through a large scale reorganization and it almost feels like some of these things apply in just assessing differences between sites and, and the org structure as it's trying to realign. Good point. Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for your very active engagement, particularly all of all of you stuck around to the, to the very end. We, we do appreciate it. I think it was a really engaging workshop. We hope you like the format, uh, you know, particularly as we have other chapters that uh, we may consider uh, doing something similar on. So uh, Joe, I'm not sure, is there like survey feedback or things like that, that MDIC sends out so we can gather some feedback? Yeah, Leo, I think Leo is still on. Uh, I think Leo, you can answer that question better than I can. I think there have, but has been in the past, especially for something like this, Liz, I think it's appropriate. If we haven't done one before, we, we should send something out. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. I think that'd be great for this group. Okay, great. Okay. It, it would really help. So the Word documents, Liz, that were created, will they be shared? The strategy document? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah if, if we can resurface my, uh, my crash file, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, mine, that makes sense. I mean, just did. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I want to just uh, echo what Liz has said. Thanks for hanging in there. It's been a long afternoon. Uh, for those of you that started early this morning uh, and they listened in on the pre-recorded sessions. I thought we had a really good turnout there as well. Um, I want to do a special thank you to Leo and Desiree, Savannah, and our production group, uh, uh, Greg Gibson, who helped do the real picture uh, uh, recordings. Your flexibility for all of the work that you guys have done. Uh, big shout out to all of the, the speakers and the planning the content. Um, for those of you that participated in today's event, uh, your facilitators spent an, a lot of time getting this right and it really showed today. So I, I really do appreciate all the hard work that you guys have put into, the, into this forum today. Um, the only thing I miss is not being face-to-face, -face, which would have been really good for a nice little post forum celebration. Um, right. But uh, I, th I think, I think Today's forum really does has has exceeded expectations on our end. Uh, Cisco, I think you're still on. I don't know if you wanted to to say anything to the group before we formally uh, close. No, I think just to echo a lot of what you've already said, right? I really want to thank everyone um, for the engagement, for the participation. I've been listening into the discussions going on back and forth. For, um, uh, you know, in the space here for the quality strategy, and it always. Uh, is fascinating to me because it's the same kind of struggles even we feel internally when we're thinking about our stuff when we're trying to plan our our quality strategies. So it's, um, I guess, you know, a little bit uh, um, supportive to know that we're not the only ones going through it or that <laughs> it's not a uh, new thing here. Um, but uh, you know, it's also encouraging to know that you know, there's a path forward and that does sometimes take that discussion and that hard work needs to be done um, in order to, to really get to something that is meaningful and can move things along. Um, but I don't think we'd get there. And as often happens with all these forums, we FDA learn a lot from the discussions and the engagement. So I truly do appreciate that and the work that went into this, um, especially since it is remote and that's always a lot more difficult to, uh, to manage and, and uh, really execute. So, um, you know, thank you. I think from our really our take and our perspective on this, um, it's been uh, a wonderful engagement and forum, and hopefully soon we'll be able to do this again in, in a face-to-face -face uh, version. All right, everyone, again, thank you very much thank for you. all thank your you. hard work. Okay, Appreciate thanks. it. Bye now. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.